Hello everyone, thank you for coming. Welcome to the WRC seminar. <coughs> I am very happy to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Henrietta Lerigova. She's assistant professor with the Department of Geology and Geophysics. She did her PhD from the University of Florida and her master's and undergraduate degrees from uh, Technical University. And <coughs> Her area of research is geochemistry, and basically, or mostly, uses chemical tracer to coastal hydrology and uh, biogeochemistry. Her recent work investigated uh, some, some studies here, uh, submarine ground uh, water discharge, and there was some interesting project where she studied dispersion of uh, radio radioisotopes. Uh, originated from uh, Fukushima uh, incident. We heard about the earthquake and tsunami. And she is also involved in a sustain sustainable ecosystem management study in Haiti and can you take me? Thank you. Would you like your phone? Are the lights okay? No? Okay. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. And um, the topic of my today's talks, uh, talk is submarine groundwater discharge and how this process is a link between any watershed processes and the coastal ocean. And many of you think of rivers when you think about the linkages between the terrestrial and uh, marine environment. Um, rivers are obviously a huge source of terrestrial matter, but submarine groundwater discharge is oftentimes um, forgotten or not, um, haven't been discovered yet uh, in many areas as a significant source of, of terrestrial material to the um, ocean environment. And I would like to emphasize right at the beginning that um, I'm part of a group um, that decided to collaborate on, collaborate on this topic and um, uh, among others and we kind of established the hydrology and coastal groundwater research group. So um, Craig Glenn and Ali al Qadi are, are um, the other professors from the geology and geophysics department and we collaborate with many others from our and other departments. Uh, also the numerous students, uh, postdoc and current students that worked on these projects that I will be um, discussing. And because submarine groundwater discharge, the topic itself, is perhaps not so familiar for everyone, I thought I'd give a, a little bit of a broader overview as an intro, um, introduce this topic to you. And um, then I talk about uh, the quantification and the significance of groundwater discharge. What is it, um, how it affects the coastal zone, uh, specifically some Hawaii case studies. So uh, for many of you working in water resources research, um, submarine groundwater discharge may already be familiar in terms of leakage or underflow. That's how it's um, referred to for a water budget, um, for example, for the islands. And indeed, um, submarine groundwater discharge is the flow of groundwater from the terrestrial environment to the coastal ocean. And um, the, the groundwater is replenished by precipitation and recharged to the, uh, to the ground um, and then the difference in the hydraulic head between the aquifer and the ocean drives the groundwater flow towards the ocean. Um, we have some flow lines here that are very simple, uh, in a simplistic way, uh, identify in which way the groundwater would flow to the ocean and um, <coughs> This is, of course, a representation of a very homogeneous uniform aquifer where we don't have any confining layers and so forth, and not many of those around here, but still um, there are some, and um, those have been well studied to understand this, this process. Um, of course, um, a freshwater lens in a coastal aquifer floats on top of uh, seawater that intruded into the aquifer, and there is this brackish zone or the uh, salinity transition zone that lies 
between the fresh, entirely fresh and the saline groundwater and because of the flow of this fresh groundwater in the aquifer, it also entrains some of this brackish water and makes it move. And so that's one of the mechanisms by which some salty groundwater is discharged also to the coastal zone. But there are, of course, other processes that drive um, uh, the, the saline, so the, the marine water, into the aquifer and then out. Um, and this process happens on many scales depending on the coastal aquifer. So the scale I showed you was um, the near shore environment, but um, if we have any other confining units or any other complexity to the aquifer, we might see um, a confining unit uh, thinning out, going farther offshore, uh, creating springs if there is enough uh, hydraulic gradient within this aquifer. Um, and uh, um, actually, uh, this can get much more complex. For example, the east coast of the US, the, the white shelf is thought to contain several of these confining layers um, and discharge of fresh and brackish springs uh, far offshore. So when you go to the coastline, how would you recognize that there is submarine groundwater discharge? Um, sometimes it's obvious. For example, this is a photograph I took in uh, Spring Creek in Florida. This is a system of about 14 springs like this. They are huge uh, for scale. Here you have a couple of boats. Um, um, and this spring comp complex consists of, as I said, several springs that have both fresh, salty, and brackish wide variety of salinities and also temperatures of this water. Um, uh, but it's not always this as obvious. You not always have such um, discrete springs. Sometimes it's just little boils that you might see on the beach when you walk around in the sand, or if you can make it out on this picture. There is a confining clay layer actually um, that's not very well visible on this image uh, that's covered by sand and so we have these rivulets of water that run um, to the coastline um, at low tide. Um, also in much more exotic places such as um, this is a picture from um, the Antarctic Peninsula where we see some surface runoff but also a lot of the water infiltrates into the ground where um, after which it flows out at the coastline um, after it's been warmed up so it creates very nice um, warm springs. Um, and then again in a much warmer environment here in Hawaii we have um, coastal springs and actually early on the Hawaiians recognized that groundwater discharge to the coastal ocean um, brings in nutrients and fresh water and created many fish ponds around um, coastal springs. Um, we also have ankline ponds that are not directly connected to the coastline but there is a nice groundwater story to them also so I will touch on them. So these are some of the obvious examples of groundwater discharge. And here I have a little cartoon for those of you who, who need a more um, <clears throat> uh, uh, um, uh, um, deeper um, uh, image of a uh, water cycle. So you have, we have these smiley raindrops that of course are part of the water cycle. And ground, submarine groundwater discharge is indicated right here on the bottom, uh, which unfortunately we can't read at this resolution. But it says that groundwater, after spending a lot of time sleeping, having coffee and whatnot in the ground, eventually discharges to the ocean, completing the water cycle. And that's one of the significant things I would like to emphasize. Uh, between the rivers, the significant difference between rivers and streams as opposed to groundwater discharge. Rivers and streams immediately respond to rain events and storms uh, within um, and um, so we see a significant increase after a storm event within hours as opposed to for the groundwater it takes a much longer time. Sometimes it's months to respond and really see an increase in the flow and once it increases it also takes a much longer time uh, while the peak flow persists and that is one of the, as I said, the significant differences I would like to emphasize because after storm events we see immediate effect from streams but then a prolonged, much more pronounced, subtle effect from groundwater discharge that persists actually oftentimes year round. Okay, so after the smiley raindrops, here we have a much grimmer picture of a reality. Again, on top of this water cycle, we see that um, the groundwater gets um, uh, polluted 
oftentimes from urban runoff, agricultural activities, leaky septic systems, and so forth. And so we care about groundwater discharge not because it's part of the water cycle, but because it's a conveyor belt of um, pollutants and other chemical components to the marine environment. And I illustrated and described this freshwater flow, and we also have seawater recirculation. Um, we don't just care about the freshwater part, but also the brackish part, because as soon as the seawater enters the aquifer, it mixes with some of the, the freshwater or even just picks up nutrients within this area. And when it discharges, it, it has a completely different composition than when it entered the aquifer. And so submarine groundwater discharge, and I will abbreviate it as SGD from now on. So when I refer to SGD, it's a, a discharge of subsurface fluids of any composition across the land-ocean interface. So it can be fresh or brackish. And again, even if it's salty, it's already altered because it either mixed with um, other waters or just picked up some terrestrial signature from entering the aquifer itself. And I mentioned already um, rivers and how they are also significant for this terrestrial transport. Um, estuaries have been studied um, 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 and, and the behavior of many of chemicals, nutrients, trace metals and so forth have been studied in, in surface estuaries. Well, there is a very similar story in the subterranean environment. We also have an estuary where freshwater and seawater mix and that's a location of complex biogeochemical processes that need to be studied. This is also the prime location where um, the, the chemical signature is uh, altered before the water can enter the marine environment. So as I said, we care about SGD because it's part of the hydrological cycle. It's been estimated that SGD is maybe 10-30% of river flow globally, but there are some places where SGD is much more than, than river discharge. If just look around at home here, for example, in Big Island and Kona, we do not have rivers. SGD is the only conveyor belt of terrestrial um, <coughs> uh, salutes to the marine environment. Um, and it's been also estimated, uh, so this was done based on just freshwater discharge. Total SGD, so fresh and uh, recirculated seawater and brackish um, uh, groundwater may take as, uh, maybe as much as 80 to 160 percent of river discharge into the Atlantic Ocean and I will return to this estimate in a minute. And because there are solutes that travel within this water, obviously SGD influences chemical budgets, many different elements and, and components have been studied, um, nutrients specifically we care about nitrogen, phosphorus, but also pharmaceuticals, trace metals. It's been shown to remove some of uranium from the ocean because of the reducing proce biogeochemical processes that happen within the subterranean estuary. And so because it's a source of nutrients, of course, it also affects the biological processes. Um, and as I said, it's a pathway for non-point source pollution. So the, the seminal study that really started this field in a wider perspective was um, uh, the one done by Billy Moore in 1996, where he looked at radium enrichment. Radium is an, um, a natural element that's produced um, in an aquifer. Uh, it's also transported by rivers. But um, So he measured radium in the South Atlantic Bight in the coastal region going up hundreds of kilometers from the shelf. And he he found that even after he accounted for all the river input, he had so much excess radium. And um, of course, sampling also groundwater, he found that, hey, that is probably the source that brings in the, radi the excess radium to the coastal environment. And indeed, um, what he estimated was that um, there is a significant flux of groundwater to the South Atlantic Bight. <coughs> 
Um, and then actually, so he's been working in this field ever since and, and did more studies and trying to scale up getting, getting better global estimates of SGD. In 2008, he published this paper um, where he used radium 228, so another isotope. Again, the same story. Radium comes into the ocean by groundwater discharge and also by rivers. We have very little atmospheric dust input um, and release from continental sediments, but accounting for all these other sources, there is still this excess radium that um, he um, assigned to come from submarine groundwater discharge and um, based on the excess radium in the Atlantic Ocean, he estimated that um, groundwater discharge um, is as much as 80 to 100 to 160 percent of, of river discharge. So potentially it, it is an important um, flux of water and solutes. So in what way the water really flows can be really observed as we have these nice cartoons that I showed you. Indeed, we do have actual measurements. Um, this image right here comes from Buckhead Bay, Massachusetts, um, where the coastal aquifer is actually a very uniform 10 meter thick layer of sand laying about um, a confining unit. So those 10 meters of, of sand house this really nice um, freshwater lens and we have the, the, the wedge here. Um, the, the lines that I have here indicate poor water samples, so groundwater samples every 20 centimeters or so going from about a, a meter down to eight or in some places 11 meters into um, into the aquifer. Um, so again, this is all sandy aquifer, uh, very easy to sample for poor water. And the numbers, the little numbers here indicate salinities. So we really see this nice fresh, um, fresh water, completely fresh water flowing towards Wakiot Bay. And then we see the recirculated seawater. And the transition zone here where we see the brackish environment, so the um, <coughs> So the salinity transition zone, that's restricted to a meter or two. That's a, uh, very different from what we observe here in Hawaii, where on the big, uh, I'm sorry, on Oahu, it's 100, of 100 feet or so. Um, and that's, of course, driven by <coughs> geology and, 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 and other factors. Um, so indeed, we can observe, we can measure. We have, uh, we had piezometers in here that uh, we estimated hydraulic gradients and groundwater flow, and and um, oh yes, and so um, obviously that helped us estimate the freshwater flow. But can we really see the brackish and salty groundwater discharge? How can we measure that? Because hydraulic gradients don't necessarily help that. Um, to do that, we actually use benthic chambers. So these are 55 gallon drums. We cut off the top 30 centimeters or so. Um, they have a vent right here. Uh, we push these into the ground on top of any of these boils or even not so obvious locations uh, where we suspect that there is groundwater discharge. and the, the groundwater discharge it places pushes out water from the drum that exits through the vent. Um, the very simple devices early on we used to attach bags. We would time how fast it fills the bag itself. Um, and then later on we used these automated devices that's a heat pulse um, flow meter that could resolve fluxes as low as a couple of centimeters per day. Um, so this figure right here shows you uh, a measurement using one of these chambers. Um, this was an area where we didn't see much tidal fluctuation. Um, you see that groundwater advection rate, so the linear advection rate is on the order of a couple of centimeters per day, so that's rather low. Um, whenever we have a rain event, we see a spike. Um, um, and also some um, wave setup up and, and so forth. Um, influence the measurement. And <clears throat> as we go along the coastline, so if this is the near shore environment and we go uh, offshore and this is the log of distance, this is the log of measured rate, the advection rate, uh, there is a logarithmic um, decay, so the farther we go from the shoreline, the lower um, SGD we get. And, and this is a pretty um, uniform, uh, I'm sorry, sorry this, this is pretty valid for any, uh, most of the study sites that, that we looked at. And so I, I return to this image now because um, 
what I want to emphasize is um, there has been more studies, of course, to understand what's happening right here. Besides uh, the biogeochemistry, if, if we know that freshwater discharge will really depend on how much recharge happens on the terrestrial environments, on the terrestrial end, but that's not the whole answer. Um, the seawater recirculation is partially driven by sea conditions, so what's happening in the ocean itself. So a very nice study was just published by Megan Ganya from Vakyot Bay again um, on looking at uh, groundwater levels. So, so let me get back here. So this, um, as we have these piezometers, uh, specifically let's look at this one. So that would be somewhere here or maybe this one, yeah, it doesn't matter, yeah. Anyway, so we are looking at this piezometer, so this profile, which was sampled every month at uh, spring low tide. Um, <coughs> um, and this is the record, so this is time on the x-axis and on the y-axis. Uh, we have the depth and the colors indicate salinity. So the uh, red colors indicate salty water and the blue colors indicate fresh water. Whenever we have high recharge, this fresh water, salt water interface moves towards the ocean. Um, and wherever the recharge decreases or there are high withdrawals from the aquifer, the salinity transition zone moves landward. And as that moves, um, if we look at this um, piezometer, then this salty layer increases in height when the land shrinks and moves landward. So that's indeed what's observed here. So whenever we see this increase in salinity, that means the freshwater land mm -hmm. shrank because of withdrawals or less precipitation, less recharge. And so that's what we thought early on. This is the really driver that we should consider for, for groundwater discharge. But, but Megan just shown um, recently that actually sea level is just as important. So the sea level is the black line. Um, they showed, uh, they used modeling for this um, uh, mod flow and sea what to show that um, when we observe the largest recharge of, um, or, of seawater intrusion into the aquifer um, and when we see the largest freshwater discharge, so freshwater would be the, the blue, the dark blue um, shaded area. And they showed that indeed sea level plays just as much role of a role in how much groundwater discharge is observed as the recharge. Um, to the aquifer, which is quite significant, especially for environments like Hawaii where we have very permeable, uh, pearls, um, highly conductive layers that where the seawater um, sea level um, also plays a role. Um, so that's on seasonal level and maybe even more because, for example, the Atlantic Ocean sea levels change on deca decadal scales. But um, um, so that would be the seasonal response of the subterranean estuary and the freshwater lands to precipitation. Um, we also observe a much shorter time scale of changes in groundwater discharge. What this image on the right shows you is um, we measured radon, which is a chemical element that's highly enriched, uh, that groundwater is highly enriched in, but the ocean has none of it. So in the ocean water where you observe radon, that means you have to have groundwater discharge. And the more discharge you have, the higher coastal radon concentration will be. So the coastal radon concentration was measured over a couple of weeks, and it's, it's shown that whenever we have low tide, we have higher radon. Um, and also lower salinity, that's when we have higher groundwater discharge. So definitely we see a tidal signature in, in groundwater discharge, which makes sense because we have a change in hydraulic gradient between low and high tide. Um, and lastly, for the, uh, the, the last slide for the general introduction would be this image that shows still Vakyot Bay in Massachusetts, where we have the salinity on the top figure, but then we also have the nitrogen components within the aquifer, the subterranean estuary. We have the nitrate, nitrite uh, plume, and the core um, ammonium plume within the freshwater lands, and the recirculated seawater is all uh, composed of ammonium, all of the nitrogen species are in form of ammonium, um, and this is also a very reducing environment. So there is a complex story of um, 
biogeochemistry happening here. For example, that the ammonium really disappears within the subterranean estuary as soon as the water starts mixing with um, or starts getting oxygenated. The, the aquifer, oxygen can penetrate into this part of the aquifer and so all the ammonium is actually converted to nitrate, nitrite. Um, and so the subterranean estuary is, to understand the subterranean estuary is really critical so that we can understand what's happening to all the nutrients traveling towards um, the ocean. So let's go to Oahu, or uh, the Hawaiian Islands now. Um, this would be a general cross section of Oahu that shows the basal aquifer and the high, high, um, high elevation aquifer, uh, groundwater. And so really groundwater discharge is restricted to the coastal environment here and, and, and here even through um, Caprock. So I won't go into much detail on this, this um, image. Um, what actually I, I will jump back. So we have precipitation that recharges groundwater. Um, some of it gets evaporated and or transpired by plants. Some of it runs off on the surface and then what recharges eventually is either taken up by um, um, pumping or flows to the ocean. And putting this water balance together um, we can calculate how much groundwater discharge we should see. Um, these images were put together based on a report, a, a series of reports by Shade and Nichols, uh, were published in the 90s. So these are all water budgets for the islands. And <coughs> um, we estimated SGD um, uh, based on the leakage or the underflow as defined in these models. And what you see the red, with the red arrows, you see the magnitude, how large groundwater, fresh groundwater discharges from these individual aquifers. The top number here shows um, how many cubic meters of fresh water discharge per meter of coastline per day. And the bottom number shows how many thousands of cubic meters of fresh water discharge uh, discharge per day. So this is all just fresh because it's based on the water balance model. And you see that um, definitely we see some coastlines where, where we have significant groundwater discharge. We may expect significant groundwater discharge. And of course we play around with the idea of how much the age of the islands matter, how much, the, how much um, it matters, um, um, how much the precipitation rate matters or, or the weathering state of the islands. So. Um, for example, in this figure, we plotted how much um, <coughs> SGD would be the red um, happens on these individual islands depending on, on their age. So Hawaii is really young um, um, and, and most of its um, um, recharge is actually, um, so how, um, how, yeah, most of its recharge um, goes out as, uh, flows out as SGD, Molokai, um, the numbers are much lower just because we are getting much less rain. So really there is no, no real trend with, against the age of the islands. Um, definitely when we look at on the x-axis is now precipitation. Um, <coughs> uh, this would be Hawaii, this would be Kauai, um, um, this would be one is Maui and one is Oahu and this is Molokai. And, um, <coughs> What's well, actually of more significance, so these really don't show much of a correlation. The most significant um, information that we get from this is SGD versus runoff. So how much of the precipitation um, runs off as streams versus goes into the ground and then exits as SGD. On Oahu it's 2.5, on Molokai it's 2, on Hawaii it's 1. And that's, um, <coughs> Hawaii is especially um, interesting because we have the windward side where we have streams um, that dominate the, the, the terrestrial to ocean environment transport, but on the other side we have almost 100% SGD. But anyway, this number for Oahu, for example, is significant. So streams are significant, but we also have to pay attention to SGD. And so, um, uh, really the work that um, Craig Glenn pioneered uh, using thermal imagery um, to look for the locations where groundwater discharge happens is, is this 
they produce these spectacular images. Um, what we see here is the land and the ocean environment. Um, groundwater, because it recharges at higher altitudes, it's colder. That cold signature is preserved as it flows towards the ocean. And so we see a discharge of colder groundwater into the warmer ocean. The dark colors indicate colder, and the uh, red colors indicate warm water. So you see how leaking 